Welcome to Online Worship here at Christ Lutheran Church in Woodcliffe Lake, New Jersey. I'm Pastor Mark, and I'm so glad you are here on this fifth Sunday in Lent. The season of Lent is a time when we are honest about who we truly are, yet this journey is not without hope. Every Sunday in Lent is an opportunity to remember that Jesus Christ has made you his own. The hope of the resurrection grounds our faith even during difficult times. And if you're worshiping right when this video premieres or watching it later on, remember that the love of God is with you forever. If this is your first time with us, welcome. And if you've been here the whole time, thank you. Thank you for being the church, no matter what. If you need a bulletin to help follow along with worship, you can find one on our website at wwwclc 4 u.com. Worship will consist of prayers, a message for all of God's children, readings from the Bible, a sermon, music, and the giving of Holy Communion. If you are using the bulletin, you'll notice that some of the lines are in bold. That's a sign, an invitation for you to join in, because worship is something we get to do together. So speak those bolded words out loud and sing along to every song. I'm also going to invite you to feel free to interact with this worship. You can do so by leaving comments on our Facebook page or by sharing the video with all your friends online. You can live into the kingdom of God by simply sharing the worship you are doing right now. So let us come together and we will start with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in the cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. And now let us be led in song by David and Arjean as they sing, Blessed Be Your Name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be Blessed be your name. 
So it's my tradition, after the prayer of the day, to bring a message to all of God's children. And I have with me a little box that has been sitting under my desk for the past six years or so. The box is about the size of a shoebox with busted edges and a pushed in top, and a picture on the front of what it contains. Inside this box is a small model of one of my favorite villains from Doctor Who, which is a sci-fi television show from England. And the villain, it basically looks like a salt shaker that is the size of a person, with an old stick shift from a truck for its eye. It's a Dalek, and the box contains dozens of little plastic pieces that when put together, forms a Dalek that you can display on your desk. Now to make it, you've got to carefully take the, pic the pieces out of the box, make sure they're smooth and clean, then paint them the right color. After the paint dries, you then carefully assemble all the pieces together. Models like this aren't that comp complicated, but they do take a bit of patience and some time to put together. But as you can see, when I open the box, you'll notice that all the pieces are still in their little plastic forms. I've opened this box before, but I've never started the model, even though I've had this box for almost 20 years. It's traveled with me from college to New York City to seminary and out here to Woodcliffe Lake. I've probably moved this little box maybe 15 times from apartment to apartment, from house to house, which is why the box is a little scrunched and a little broken. Every time I move it, I tell myself I should really make time to start this model, but I don't. Instead, it still sits in this box under my desk. So why do I keep something for 20 plus years that remains unfinished? Well, one reason I do that is because this was a gift. My brother bought it for me on one of my birthdays long ago, and he promised me that he would also get me the paints and the glue. Now, since I know he's watching, just a quick reminder, bro, that I'm still waiting for the paint. But that's not the reason why I've kept it for so long. It's stayed with me because it represents something special. It is a gift from someone who knows me and who cares about me. It also represents in a tangible way our relationship, even though we live far apart and we haven't seen each other in quite a while because of the pandemic. We are connected, not just because we're family, but because we actually try to learn and grow and take care of one another. I could have probably purchased a completed one of these on eBay if all I wanted was my own personal Dalek to sit on a desk. But the gift, what it represents and what it means, is worth way more than any piece of painted plastic. Now as Lutheran Christians, we see gifts all around us. We see creation the universe and the planet Earth as a gift from God. We see the relationships God gives us with people who know us and who care for us as gifts. And we also see the opportunities, those opportunities we have to learn and to grow and to become more loving as gifts from God too. Jesus himself is an incredible gift who shows us that we matter, that we're included, and that God is always with us. But another gift from God that we don't always think of as a gift is our faith itself. When we say we believe in God, we believe in Jesus, and we know we are loved, we need God's help to say that. We need God's help to realize that the creator of the universe really does care about you and me. Because sometimes we don't think that, or feel that, or we're too busy with our lives that we almost act as if God doesn't exist. 
we doubt, we ask questions, and we sometimes discover that our prayers go unanswered. There are times when we're mad at God, angry at our world, or we just don't feel like loving all the people that are around us. And so if God always required us to always believe, to always trust, to never put our faith in a box that we leave under our desk, unfinished and unopened for years, then we wouldn't really have a faith at all. God knows that. So God keeps coming to us and gifts us faith, one that is always open to the other gifts from God. And even if we don't see it or feel it, or if we see something that makes us wonder if God is real, the gift of faith from God is always there for us. Because even if we are struggling to believe in God, God believes in you. And God loves you because you are you. And God promises to be with you forever. So let us now continue to experience Jesus by listening to two readings from our Bible. A reading from Jeremiah, chapter 31, beginning with the 31st verse. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their inequity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. A reading from the Gospel according to John, the 12th chapter. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I want to start by inviting you to imagine a banjo. Yes, I really said a banjo. I don't usually see many banjos here in northern New Jersey but it's a musical instrument with a long history in the United States. I've always appreciated the twang in its sound and how effortless it looks when played. The banjo in popular culture is a symbol of the Appalachian Mountains and the bluegrass regions of Kentucky. It's a sound that sounds old and one that might ask us to dress like we're living in the 1800s. 
So now that you have a banjo in mind, think about who might be playing it. Dream up the clothes they're wearing, the hat on their head, if they have shoes on their feet, and even if they're a Muppet or a human. Once you have that image in your head of that banjo player just plucking away, take one more good look at them. And then answer this question. What's the color of their skin? Rhiannon Giddens is a founding member of the country blues and old time music band, Carolina Chocolate Drops. She's a Grammy Award winner and was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship in 2017. She was drawn to this style of music through the twang of the banjo. And while listening to an interview with her this week, I learned a lot about where the banjo comes from. In my head, I imagined the banjo being from poor rural white areas of the Appalachian Mountains. But that's not right at all. The banjo is actually descended from musical instruments that originally came from Africa. When African people were caught, sold, and then shipped to the Western Caribbean in the 17th century to be enslaved, they brought a version of the banjo with them. Eventually, in the late 1700s or so, the banjo arrived in the southern United States. And it spread through enslaved African American communities, who then taught white folks how to play. Banjos were originally handmade out of gourds, and they had a much deeper, more earthy sound than we hear today. Rhiannon herself plays a replica of a banjo made in 1858, and she continues to show all of us that the music of America has deep African-American roots. The soundtrack of our collective history is rich, varied, and diverse. And she's used that history to reveal the stories of our past, while giving them a sound that speaks to where those stories took place. And one of those stories is in her song, Julie. The song is set during the Civil War and comes from words recorded in the memoirs of an enslaved person. When the United States Army reoccupied territory that had rebelled against it, large plantations were typically raided and their valuables taken. When the owners of these plantations learned soldiers were coming, they did whatever they could to hide their gold, jewels, and silver. The soldiers at first focused their attention on the large homes, and they ignored the places where enslaved people slept. So that gave the plantation owners an idea. They would go to the people they believed they owned, hand them their valuables, and tell them to hide it or claim them as their own. Once the soldiers left, the owners assumed the people they viewed as their property would still belong to them and that they would give those objects back. The song Julie tells a story of two women, two mothers, having one of these kinds of conversations. One of them is an unnamed enslaved African American, and the other is a white mistress who wanted to hide some valuables. The song begins with the mistress in a panic because the devils, aka the United States Army, were on their way. She implored this enslaved person to run, worried she would be taken away from all she's ever known. But the enslaved person says, no, she'll stay because she knows what those soldiers represent. So the mistress changed her tune and told the enslaved person to hide a chest full of gold from those soldiers. Tell them, the mistress says, that all this money belongs to you. And so the enslaved person took the money and told the mistress that the money already belonged to her because it was that pile of gold, that pile of money, was money the mistress earned when she sold three of the enslaved person's children and had them taken away. Now it takes a certain kind of gumption to believe you could go to a person you've enslaved, that you treated as your property and, was, and you saw as an object less than human, and ask them to protect your ill-gotten wealth. 
We might at first want to dismiss the mistress of the plantation as someone incredibly aloof, since she asked something so brazen. Yet her actions reveal, I think, I think, a truth we don't always see. She, in that moment, didn't imagine she was doing anything wrong. She had worked hard, earned what she had, and she didn't see that her way of life believed that some people mattered while others did not. She couldn't even fathom that a person with dark skin was a human being just like her. She had, without even realizing it, dehumanized herself by refusing to see the image of God in a person of African descent. In Rhiannon's words, to dehumanize someone, you have to dehumanize yourself first. And we, ever, and we rarely ever notice when that happens. Now, there's no real comparison between the experience of the white mistress and the enslaved mother, mother who had three children forcibly removed. That experience of oppression and the inability to control the violence done to her body and her family was much worse than the experience of the mistress who tried to hide some gold. Yet racism itself requires the dehumanization of all people. Because the one who was turned into an object to be abused and oppressed was brought to that place by another human being. Now, when Andrew and Philip approached Jesus in today's reading from the Gospel according to John, I'm pretty sure they weren't thinking about a banjo. But I wouldn't be surprised if they struggled with this request from the Greeks. In the ancient world, one way people were grouped was whether they were Jewish or not. Everyone who wasn't Jewish was either called a Gentile or a Greek. The Greeks in this passage might not even have been Greek, but the Holy Spirit drew them to the city of God, and while there, they knew they had to see Jesus. So they approached the disciples and asked, to see him. And Jesus responded by telling more of his own story. He would be betrayed. He would be killed. Yet he would live into the vision shared in John 3:17 that the entire world and all it contained would continue to be loved by God. In Christ, the barrier between who was included and who was not would be undone. In Christ, God's arms would be open to all, even during moments of immense anxiety, uncertainty, and fear. And those who were called to become part of Jesus' own body would become new and receive eyes that see God within one another. We would be given the opportunity to listen to each other's truths and discover a fuller story about ourselves in that process. And when we don't, don't, that's when racism rears its head and convinces us that we don't need to know what we don't know. Racism ends up blinding us to the pain within other people's stories, and it acts as if our reality should be the limit of what the world can be. It sees others as objects that somehow cause us to commit unimaginable harms. And this sin can be so invisible, so ingrained in the air we breathe, that we can't imagine life being any other way. We can't see what we can't see. And we tend to get defensive when others show us what our world is really like. When we find ourselves in positions where we don't have to worry if the strangers around us will either harm us or hurt us, or demand us to prove we really are human beings, then we need to make sure that we're not dehumanizing the people around us by not listening to their stories. The brutal attack in Atlanta this past week has, sadly, forced us to listen to the truths told by the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. And we can choose to open ourselves 
to those stories of this so-called model minority that has been marginalized through fetishization, racism, and more. We get to ask questions on how we contribute to a wider culture that places people into boxes instead of offering all people the freedom to share who they are. And even though these questions can lead us into uncomfortable places, it's something we get to do because you have already been included in God's holy family through baptism and through faith. You didn't earn your spot with God, nor are you entitled to it. Rather, God reached out to you as you are because God's love couldn't do anything less. And since Jesus Christ was willing to go to the cross to draw all people to himself, we can do our smaller part by making sure we stay open to all. Amen. And now let's listen to our Jean and David as they sing Beneath the Cross of Jesus. And now let us move into the offering portion of our worship, based on work by Reverend Carol Penner. Let us pray. We have the means to give, we have the reason to give, and there are many waiting for us to give. Yet often our hands hold back, and we hoard what we have for ourselves. The season of Lent is a season where we remember that all that we have and all that we are comes from you, our God. Through your love you created us, and through that same love you redeemed us. You do not see us as the world sees us, or as we see ourselves. You know our joys, our failures, our hurt, and the ways we've hurt others. Yet your cross-shaped love refuses to let us go. Help us live and give in your kingdom of love, where there are no enemies, only human beings, and kindness is in the air we breathe. In Jesus' name. Amen. CLC is grateful for your generosity so that we can be generous to others with our ministry. 
If you would like to support this ministry, you can do so on our website, or by writing a check and dropping it in the mail to us. We will use your generous gift to generously offer the Word of God to all people and to serve our neighbors in need. Now on this fifth Sunday in Lent, let us offer both our laments and our petitions to God. When you hear the words, O faithful God, in your steadfast love, please respond with, have mercy on us. O God, we lament that over the past months, many Christians have not been able to assemble in person for worship. Many believers have languished alone. And we pray. Strengthen all Christians, especially our bishops Elizabeth and Tracy, and all Christians in the covenant of their baptism. Guide and bless the work of Kimberly Cooper, who will be ordained later today as the new pastor of St. Timothy's Lutheran Church in Wayne. Equip children and teachers in Sunday school, confirmation, and service projects, whether online or in person. O faithful God, in your steadfast love, have mercy on us. We lament that by indulging our own desires, we have misused your creation and have worsened the poverty of others. And we pray. Continue your care for the earth you have made. Protect animals and their habitats. Grant weather that prepares the soil for seeds and shelter all lands from violent storms, flooding, and wildfires. O faithful God, in your steadfast love, have mercy on us. We lament that as a nation we have not ensured justice for all and equal access to freedoms and to the necessities of life. We lament ongoing prejudices and violence on our streets and in our homes. And we pray. Bring an end to the warfare and terrorism. Imbune our courts with truth and wisdom. Guide leaders, especially Joseph the President, Philip, New Jersey's governor, state legislators, and every person to shape communities that reflect your mercy, justice, and peace, and give them creativity to work for the welfare of all. O faithful God, in your steadfast love, have mercy on us. We lament the sufferings of people the world over. We lament the sorrows of the pandemic. We lament hunger, homelessness, and loneliness. And we pray, end this pandemic. Provide vaccinations to all persons around the earth. Guide us in healing the sick, welcoming the migrant, feeding the hungry, and living with others in harmony. We pray especially for Camp Koinonia, Dolores, Elysia, Anthony, Sharon, Mark, Jim, Riza, Jackson, Jean, May, Jerry, Ruben, Neil, Pat. Faye, Joyce, Lorraine, Lata, Alice, Miriam, and Earl, and those we hold in our hearts during this moment of silence. O faithful God, in your steadfast love, have mercy on us. We lament the hopelessness that afflicts so many people. We lament the anguish of refugee camps, of overcrowded hospitals, of unhappy homes. And we pray. As this Thursday we celebrate the Annunciation of the birth of Jesus, instill in us gratitude for your presence among humankind, for holding us through sorrow, and for leading us into joy. O faithful God, in your steadfast love, have mercy on us. We lament our secret sorrows known only to you, and we ask you to receive the prayers of our heart. We will now have an extended period of silence, inviting you to share your prayers with each other or online. O faithful God, in your steadfast love, have mercy on us. We lament the countless who have died of COVID 
and the diminishment of life that so many have endured. We praise you for those who have given us words for our lament and our praise. At the end, bring us with all who have died in Christ into your everlasting presence. O faithful God, in your steadfast love, have mercy on us. Since the pandemic started in early 2020, there has been more than 3,000 reported incidences of anti-Asian racism, according to Stop AAPI Hate, an initiative that tracks violence and harassment among Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. In the last few months, these violent attacks targeted the elderly and escalated with the death of many by gun violence in Atlanta last week. Prejudice, bias, and racism, either conscious or unconscious, warps God's command to see the divine within all people. I invite you to a communal confession to show our solidarity with our Asian siblings. You can find the words in our bulletin posted online or view them on the screen. God of all people and the whole of creation, make us into who you have created us to be. Make us your hands, your feet, your eyes, your lips, your body in the world. Spirit of peace, reconcile us, connect us to yourself, to each other. You are the source of our healing and hope, for if one is hurt, all of us are hurt. Clothe us, your body in the world, with your love, mercy, and grace. Amen. Asian siblings are hurting. How do we, the church, hear their painful cry and act together in solidarity? We pray, Lord, have mercy. Are Asians invisible? They are branded as the model minority. Therefore, not expected to speak up. They cry for justice. Can anyone hear them? We pray, Lord, have mercy. Asians are feared as a community. Asians have complex cultures and languages, so they are generally omitted. How can we, the church, offer our curiosity and respect when we encounter a multitude of gifts in diversity and uniqueness. We pray, Lord, have mercy. Asian children are called many names, most recently coronavirus, or yelled at to go home. When we the church ask, who is our neighbor? How can we truly mean it in welcoming words and actions? We pray, Lord, have mercy. Asians are used by the mainstream dominant culture to shame and put a wedge against other communities of color, claiming our calling that all are created in God's image. How can we stand in solidarity with those hurting? We pray, Lord, have mercy. God's forgiveness is greater than any hurt and pain of the body. For Asian theologies, forgiveness is an invitation to examine and re-examine what constitutes our identity, not only, as, not only our individual identity, but most especially our communal identity. May God's forgiveness invite us all to face who we truly are as members of the body of Christ. May this rich promise embrace us all, taking away the pain of our battered body. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, Father of glory, in your bountiful spirit, in the name of Christ, our great high priest, now and forever. Amen. And now let's move to a version of the sharing of the peace that keeps us safe and connects us over a distance. I invite you to take a look at everyone who surrounds you in your sacred space. If you are currently by yourself, know that the entire church is, through Jesus, always with you. Send a blessing to those physically closest to you, or send a text, type out a DM, or make a plan to call someone you care about and wish that the peace of Christ may be with them. Let us now think about all who are worshiping with us online or via conference call. 
in our hearts. Let's send to your entire faith community a blessing and wish that the peace of Christ may be with them. Finally, let the blessing we offer each other go out to our families, friends, neighbors, and to the entire world. With God's help, our hearts are big enough to extend peace that far. Let us embody the peace of Christ after we leave this place today. Now let us move into the celebration of Holy Communion. If you haven't secured the items you will use, I invite you to pause this video if you can. Come back when you're ready, and we will be nourished by Jesus Christ together. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered together by the Holy Spirit across phone lines, social media, and the internet, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives bear witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me. And now for a blessing. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. 
God bless you, that you may be a blessing. In the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God. Thank you for worshiping with me today. And just a few announcements before we close. This one Wednesday will conclude our midweek Lenten worship and book study on Reverend Emmy Kegler's book, One Coin Found. Worship will start at 7 p.m. online with a discussion at 7.30 p.m. A small group of volunteers has been busy trying to get you a COVID vaccine. With the recent announcement that teachers and other essential workers are either eligible or will be soon to make appointments to get vaccinated, we want to make sure that happens. Please contact Kate Stutzel or the church office if you need help. The Special Gifts Committee recently met, which means it's time for you to start thinking about which projects you would like to fund financially. In the past, the Special Gifts Fund has been used to fund ministries here at church and also around the world. More information can be found on our website. Now, if you are using our digital bulletin, you'll notice that we have a detailed list of worship services that are coming up for Holy Week. Holy Week starts next week, March 28th, and we'll have outdoor and online worship at 10 a.m. We'll also meet for Mate Thursday online at 12 noon and 7.30, and also Good Friday. We'll have an outdoor service at 3 p.m. and an online service at 7.30 p.m. For Easter Sunday, we'll meet online and outdoors at 10 a.m., and our gene is working to secure some special music for that occasion. Please take a look at the schedule and let me know if you have any questions. On this first Sunday of spring, I am so grateful for the bright sunshine. I am so grateful for the opportunities to experience new growth. I'm so excited to see flowers bloom again. I know we are still in the middle of this pandemic. I know cases are still extremely high in our area. But let us lean into the signs of love and life that God has given us and see that the new life around us is new life that we will all experience very soon.